Good evening. I'm John Coatsworth, Provost of the University, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here uh, to the George W. Ball Lecture to be presented this evening by Professor Kishore Mabubani on what may be the crucial issue for the future of our fragile planet. Can America and China avoid a collision? A topic about which some simple-minded publications have appeared in the last year. We're hoping for a correction. First, a word about George Ball. Um, George Ball, as you may recall, served as U.S. Under Secretary of State from 1961 to 1968, and briefly as U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. His service in these posts was marked by vigorous and lonely dissent, which he did not make public until much later, from the Johnson administration's escalation of U.S. military involvement in Vietnam. He also dissented in both the Kennedy and Johnson administrations from ill-considered aspects of U.S. policy toward the Soviet Union and in the Middle East. Through the generosity of a far-sighted and anonymous donor, the George W. Ball Adjunct Professorship was created at SEPA in 2009. The Ball Professorship enabled SEPA to seek out and recruit outstanding and far-sighted individuals who combine experience as principled international practitioners and innovative thinkers on international issues. It falls to the Ball Professor to deliver each year's Ball Lectureship. I can think of no one whose views on U.S.-Asian relations need to be heard in this country more than those of this year's George W. Ball Professor, Kishore Mabubani. And it gives me great pleasure, therefore, to turn the microphone over to SIFA's Dean, Merit Jano, to introduce him. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining us uh, for this important George Ball lecture. It's probably our, our most, one of our most uh, important uh, lectures here at SIPA, and um, as mentioned by the provost, was established in 2009 to support an adjunct faculty member who had demonstrated really remarkable leadership and innovative contributions. George Ball's uh, principled and far-sighted dissents um, from Cold War orthodoxies, especially the early stages of U.S. involvement in Vietnam, really established him as an exemplar of reasoned and loyal opposition uh, during a period when uh, pressures of conformity were very much upon him. And as his New York Times obituary noted, he was perhaps best known as an early and consistent opponent of American involvement in Vietnam. In fact, I was looking over the George Ball record and uh, one of our alumni had written a very good book about him. And he produced a, a 67 page single space memo questioning the US policy in Vietnam that he presented to the National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy in the hope of influencing President Johnson. And his uh, clear-headed and rigorous analysis was not heeded. He was not an Asianist, in fact, and he had not spent any time on the ground when he wrote uh, those words. And of course, Vietnam was not the end of his influence or impact on US foreign policy. In fact, it wasn't his main focus, his real focus. In fact, he thought Asia was a distraction uh, for a better US focus on Europe. In an interesting, I think, symmetry with tonight's focus on the United States and China, George Ball contended that communist China was overrated as a menace and its existence should be accepted forthrightly. He indeed favored expanded trade with China and UN membership. So that's an interesting uh, recollection of, um, of George Ball's own thoughts. Previous holders of this uh, appointment have included Mari Pangestu, former Minister of Trade and Creative Industries for Indonesia, Jorge Castaneda, former Minister of Foreign Affairs for Mexico, Les Gelb, and others. And tonight, we're really honored to have with us uh, uh, Ambassador Professor Kishore Mabubani to deliver this lecture and to be with us this semester. As noted, he is simply uh, one of the leading thinkers and scholars on contemporary Asia and Asia relations with the world, with a remarkable and distinguished service as both a diplomat, a scholar, and an author. He had an extraordinary career with the Singapore Foreign Service from 1971 to 2004. As a diplomat, postings in Cambodia, Malaysia, Washington, New York, 
and indeed two stints as Singapore's ambassador to the United Nations and indeed as president of the UN Security Council for a period as well. He was permanent secretary at the Foreign Ministry and the founding dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy in Singapore, which I'm pleased to note, uh, SIPA has had as part of our network of public policy schools a partnership with uh, the Lee Kuan Yew School, um, and we have a wonderful flow of students going uh, back and forth. Currently, Ambassador Mabubani serves as a senior advisor and professor in the practice of public policy at the National University and concurrently serves on a number of boards and councils around the world. His books and articles have appeared in numerous uh, publications, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, Washington Quarterly. One of his early books, I particularly like the title, Can Asians Think? It was very uh, provocative. And um, his newest book, which is about to come out, is titled, Has the West Lost It? So I think he's not afraid uh, to challenge us um, in his thinking. He's been awarded uh, many uh, recognitions, listed in, as one of the top intellectuals of the world, received numerous honorary degrees, and tonight he will speak to us about US-China relations. Please join me in welcoming Kishore Mabubani. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you, Merit, for those very generous introductions. And let me say, it's really a great pleasure uh, to be here in Colombia among so many young old friends in the room. <laughs> uh, as you know, I lived in New York for 10 and a half years, and probably New York City is my second home. And so it's a great pleasure that after I stepped down as dean, I got this invitation from Colombia to be the George Ball. Uh, adjunct professor here. And of course, I, I've chosen a rather uh, challenging topic, as John said. But uh, in, in doing so, I want to mention that uh, I'm going to try and observe the spirit of uh, George Ball uh, in my remarks. <laughs> as you said, he was a great dissenter. Um, so I may also be crossing some red lines <laughs> in my comments today but I hope you'll forgive me that I, for doing so in the spirit of uh, George Paul. Now, of course, the question that I've uh, chosen to address is, as John said, is really the biggest question of our time. What is going to be the relationship between the world's number one power, United States, and the world's number one emerging power, China? And as I will describe later, uh, there's growing pessimism about what's going to happen. I think the conventional wisdom now is that there's more likely to be a collision than not. So the goal of my remarks today, which I hope to actually develop into a book, which I, which I hope will have an equally provocative title. And so what, what I'm going to share with you basically are some preliminary thoughts, my uh, uh, ideas I'm working on. And I would, of course, since I see so many good friends here, I hope that all of you will come back to me, some feedback to it. But this is how I, pro I propose to uh, uh, sort of uh, organize my remarks. I'll give a three-part answer to the question, can China and, uh, and America avoid a collision? In part one, I'll talk about the global context in which we are operating in, because the global context obviously influences the relationship within China and America. And then I'll talk about the impact of this global context on China and America. And I would like to conclude by giving some, some sort of practical advice to both China and America on how to avoid the impending uh, collision. So let me, let me begin by talking about the global context. And here I'm going to take the perspective in the sense of a future historian, someone in the year 2100, looking back at 2018, and what would he see in our world today? And frankly, what the future historian would see is the exact opposite of what is a contemporary wisdom, especially in the West. And as you know, in the West, there's a tremendous amount of pessimism about the world, where we are heading, and so on and so forth. But actually, 
from the perspective of a future historian, he or she will see clearly that the human condition has actually never been better. And indeed, in this book that, uh, which by the way, technically is not launched yet, <laughs> it'll be launched in London in April, called Has the West Lost It? This is what I say in it. And this actually describes the great, uh, how much our world has progressed. I say, imagine a world where virtually no human being goes to bed feeling hungry, or where absolute poverty has all but disappeared, where every child gets vaccinated and goes to school, where every home has electricity, where every human being carries some kind of smartphone, giving him or her access to unlimited troves of information. Right? Such a world will be considered as one that borders on utopia. But that's where we are today. In study after studies will show you that we have done a far greater job, far better job reducing violence. Steven Pinker has documented this from Harvard. As he said, we have gone from 65,000 deaths per year in the 1950s to less than 2,000 per year today. And others have noted that in 1800, there were 120 million people in the world that could read and write. Today, there are 6.2 billion people with the same skill. And let me just quote, and just one quote from Johan Nobuck of the Cato Institute. He said, if someone had told you in 1990 that over the next 25 years, world hunger would decline by 40%, child mortality would halve, and extreme poverty would fall by three quarters, you'd have told them they were a naive fool. But the naive fools were right. And I want to emphasize that by 2030, global poverty is going to go down to virtually zero. So there has been a tremendous upliftment of the human condition. And why has this happened? I can say very, very simply that at the end of the day, the Western project has succeeded. Because one of the goals of the West always was to share its best practices, its wisdom with the rest of the world, and they have spread. And, I, and I've said that there are seven pillars of Western wisdom that explain Asia's rise. I mean, seven pillars, things like free market, uh, economics, mastery of science and technology, the culture, pragmatism, culture, peace, rule of law, education, all these things are spreading around the world. And then the net result is that the, the human condition is improving, and a large part of it, of course, is due, of, of it is due because of the performance of the two most populous countries in the world, China and India. And here again, a future historian would say, well, that's not surprising. From the year one to the year 1820, the two largest economies in the world were always those of China and India. It's only in the last 200 years that China and India went down. So it's perfectly natural to go back to a world where China and India become number one and number two, and that's gonna happen by 2050 at the latest, and United States will be number three. And people will say, hey, that's a normal world that has come back. So clearly, we should be celebrating. But as you all know, we are not. <laughs> and the question is, why not? Well, there are many reasons for that. But one reason for that, of course, is that as a result of the tremendous, outstanding performance of China, the power balance between China and America has shifted dramatically. And I can tell you this, the future historian will be very surprised how fast this has happened. Now, actually, I was thinking of putting up some slides, but I thought it's better if I just give you just two statistics to remember, to, to, to show you how fast the relative balance has shifted. One statistic is in PPP terms, purchasing power parity terms, one statistic in what they call nominal market economy terms. So in PPP terms, in 1980, China's share of the global GNP was 2.2%, 1980. 
United States share was 25%, more than 10 times larger than that of China's. But by 2014, in an event that so few people notice, in PPP terms, China became number one, America became number two, and no one paid attention because everybody was paying attention to the nominal GNP figures. But actually, the change in the nominal GNP figures are even more, uh, uh, is, is even more astounding. And it's much more recent. In the year 2000, in market economy terms, China's, America's GNP was eight times that of China's. Eight times, 2000. By 2015, it was 1.6 times. From eight times to 1.6 times in 15 years. And by 2025 or even earlier possibly, China's GNP in uh, nominal terms will also become bigger. And of course, this changes everything, right? China will no longer behave in the same way that it did with the United States when it has a bigger economy. It's one thing when your economy is 10% or 15%. It's another thing when your economy is bigger. And of course, this has clearly raised a lot of alarm bells. And here I must say, uh, I'm actually astonished by the number of senior American figures eh, who keep speaking in louder and louder voices saying China is becoming a threat. The word threat is used very frequently. I just, let me just give you three or four examples. In September last year, uh, CNN says America's top military officer, General Joseph Dunford, told Congress, and I quote, I think China probably poses the greatest threat to our nation by about 2025, right? And he says China's military modernization is targeting capabilities with the potential to degrade core US military technological advantages. And of course, you've heard of the statement by General Mattis, which he built on a US DOD report in January 2018, last month, and said, we said that the two US rivals, Russia and China, are actively seeking to co-op or replace the free and open order that has enabled global security and prosperity since World War II. And General Mattis added, great power competition, not terrorism, is now the primary focus of US national security. And then you had the head of CIA, Mike Pompeo, saying, 18 days ago, 21 days ago, on 30th January, he told the BBC that the uh, Chinese efforts to exert covert influence over the West are just as concerning as Russian subversion. And then the FBI director said on February 13th, eight days ago, he says one of the th things that we're trying to do is to view the China threat as not just a whole of government threat, but a whole of society threat on their end. And I think it's going to take a whole of society response from the United States to deal with China. And these are all very senior figures. And then, of course, you have the economists coming out a few weeks ago predicting that there'll be war. And, you, of course, you have the best-selling book by Graham Allison saying war is more likely between the United States and China. So the question, therefore, is, What's driving this pessimism about China? Because if you look at Chinese behavior, the Chinese have given no indications that they're marshalling great forces out to conquer other nations or even trying to sort of replace the American role in so many parts of the world. China is still today fundamentally concerned what's happening in China. And to the best of my knowledge, does not want to step into the shoes of the United States, either in the Middle East or in Eastern Europe or anywhere else.
But nonetheless, despite that, China is perceived as a threat. The question is, why? And this is a key point I want to make. I think the fundamental reason why China is seen as a threat, either consciously, subconsciously, unconsciously, by people in America and many strategic thinkers in the West, is because China is succeeding despite the fact that it is not a democracy. China is succeeding even though it's run by the Chinese Communist Party. And I think that's the core issue from which this fundamental distrust springs. And so the question we need to ask, therefore, is, is there something fundamentally wrong with China not becoming a democracy? Should China become a democracy? Right? And I find that this is a thing that is very much in the subtext of people's minds, but the question is never discussed in full. So this is what I hope to do as the core part of my remarks, to try and dive down to find the deeper sources of the distrust that's there. And but let me begin by emphasizing that what I'm not discussing here is whether democracy is better than Chinese Communist Party rule. It's very clear that democracy obviously is a better political system. No one's going to stand up here and argue that, oh, democracy is an inferior political system. That's not the question. The question is whether China today would be better off if it gives up its Communist Party rule and converts overnight to become a democracy, which is in some ways or another the sort of hidden wish of many people. And here, maybe here, this is where I'm invoking the spirit of George Ball. I may say that if you try to view this question objectively, rationally, it's not clear that China will be better off. In fact, in many ways, China will be far worse off. Right? And this is how I think the Chinese leaders would view this question if they were asked candidly in private. They would point to several reasons why it would be a disaster for China to switch its political system today. I'm not talking about 30 years from now, today. One, many of the countries that made a sudden transition to democracy in the last few decades have suffered a great deal. And you can have many examples. Exhibit A is Yugoslavia. That country broke down. You all know how many people were killed, how democracy led to demagogues being elected, nationalism and violence and conflict. The Chinese saw all that. Exhibit B is even more important for the Chinese. They saw what happened to Russia. Russia went overnight from Communist Party rule towards democracy. And you know, when I described to you just now the, how the world global condition is improving, infant mortality going down, life expectancy going up, in Russia, the exact opposite happened after democracy came. Life expectancy went down, infant mortality went up, the economy imploded, and people suffered enormously. And I, I do know that the Chinese have studied in great detail what happened to Russia, because they say, hey, this could happen to us too. So they have seen it, and they know what could happen to China. And the second point is this. If the Chinese view their history objectively and observe what happened in the last, let's say, 40 years since Deng Xiaoping launched his four modernizations exactly 40 years ago, in 1978. If you look at it against the backdrop of the last two, 3,000 years of Chinese history, the last 40 years 
are clearly the best 40 years in the last 200 years since the Opium War, definitely, of 1842. But even more amazingly, if you view objectively the human condition of the Chinese people from the top to the bottom, it's never been better in 4,000 years. So the last 40 years have delivered a human condition that the Chinese people have never, ever experienced. Where virtually everybody goes to school. Where everybody has a meal. And people can do an amazing number of things. I can tell you, when I went in 1980 for the first time to China, to Beijing, people couldn't choose what to wear. They all wore Maoist suits, right? They couldn't choose where to live, where to work, where to study. <laughs> None of these choices were, for them, were available for them. Today, the same Beijing, which used to have only bicycles and no cars, has got massive traffic jams, used to have low buildings, now only has skyscrapers, and has this amazing, booming middle class that is, that is already today the world's largest middle class. So in the last 40 years, China has produced the world's largest middle class population. And of course, they don't enjoy many of the political freedoms, clearly, that Americans enjoy. But I can tell you, that 40 years ago, no Chinese young student could go and study in any Ivy League or any other American university. Today, over 300,000 do, and most of them go back. But when, let me give an even more stunning statistic. In the year 1980, there were zero Chinese tourists going overseas. Zero. Only government officials travel. It was impossible for an ordinary Chinese citizen to travel. Today, 120 million Chinese right, go overseas freely. And 120 million Chinese go back to China freely. So, I mean, to go back to the old Soviet analogy, if this was a nation of gulags, oppressive state, why would 120 million Chinese go back? Right? So clearly something fundamental has changed in the Chinese condition, even while it's been under Communist Party rule. So what the United States sees as a completely static picture of China still remaining under Chinese Communist Party rule is a China that has been completely transformed in the last 40 years. But there are even other things that are even more amazing about contemporary China. Now, as you know, the theory is very clear. If you don't have democracy, if you don't have freedom of speech, if you don't have freedom of media, people cannot think, they cannot innovate, and they cannot become masters of world industries, right? Now, I can tell you, that the Chinese people don't have the right to vote, they don't have freedom of speech, they don't have freedom of media, but they're developing the most innovative economy in the world. In theory, it's not supposed to happen. In practice, it's happening. And I can tell you, for, for someone like me who goes to China regularly, it's mind-boggling how China keeps changing year by year. And I find, you know, I come from Singapore, one of the most successful states in Asia, right? We always thought we'd be ahead of China. And then I discover to my embarrassment that Singapore is so far behind because we still carry cash around. <laughs> no one in China carries cash. Everyone carries a smartphone. They look at me very strangely when I produce cash. What's this? Don't you know? And when I went to give some lectures at Peking University, the guy escorting me just took his phone, put it on two bicycles. I bicycled to my destination just with a phone. You can do anything in China with a phone. 
right? And if you want a hot fried egg for breakfast at your doorstep, you get it in China. That kind of, that kind of quality of innovation that they're doing, it's stunning. And this is not just in consumer areas. I mean, I, I don't know enough about artificial intelligence. I don't know enough about uh, supercomputers. I don't know enough about space exploration. But I do know that they've made huge advances in those areas. So what in theory is not supposed to happen is happening. But at the same time, the American perception hasn't changed. And here, let me read to you something. It's a literal quote from the National Security Strategy of the United States of 2002, uh, George W. Bush's administration. Thank you, Andy. Andy Nathan was my source. I saw it in his class. I said, wow, I must use this slide. <laughs> uh, and this is what the statement says. We welcome the emergence of a strong, peaceful, and prosperous China. The democratic development of China is crucial to the future. Yet, a quarter century after beginning the process of shedding the worst features of the communist legacy, China's leaders have not yet made the next series of fundamental choices about the character of their state. And they say, they add, in, China, in, in time, China will find that social and political freedom is the only way that China can become great. But China is becoming great. And this statement seems so strange. This is what the theory is supposed to be. But the practice is completely different. And so, going back to the perspective of a future historian, looking at American perceptions of China, and insisting that China must follow the American path, the future historian will scratch his head and say, this is a civilization that's been around for 4,000 years. It has had its ups, its downs, ups and downs. Now it's rising with great ferocity. The last 40 years have been the best 40 years in China's history. And just at a moment when it's doing incredibly well, a young 250-year-old nation is telling the 4,000-year civilization, you don't know what's good for you. We know what's good for you. If you don't become democratic, if you don't have human rights, if you don't unleash all that, you will go nowhere. Again, a future historian will be very, very puzzled by this statement, just looking over the long view at what China has done. So clearly, what I'm trying to suggest to you very delicately <laughs> is that it's time for America to change its language and concepts that it uses to understand China. And it is obviously what's happening in China doesn't fit Western political theory. So you have a choice. Do you want to stick to the theory or do you want to pay attention to the facts? And the facts don't fit the theory. And so we have to adjust and deal with this. Because if you don't do it, then clearly the collision course will come. Because China, I am almost 99.9% .9 certain, will not change its political system on the advice of the United States of America. It won't. It just won't. It's going to keep on doing what it thinks is right for itself. And the question, therefore, is can the United States accept this? Right? And here I want to add an important historical footnote no? uh, that actually I must confess I just read from Graham Allison's book, The Thucydides the Trap Book. And he says many in America wish that China could be like America as it was rising. And Graham Allison adds, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> because he says in 1897, soon after Teddy Roosevelt arrived in Washington, D.C., 
within 10 years of Teddy Roosevelt arriving in Washington, D.C., and he, Teddy Roosevelt, as you know, was so confident that the American century was on the way, so sure that history was on his side, and he marched on, and this is what he did. The United States declared war on Spain, expelling it and acquiring Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines. He threatened Germany and Britain with war, supported insurrection in Colombia to create Panama, declared itself policeman of Western Hemisphere, and asserted its right to intervene anywhere. United States as a rising power. So Graham Allison gives some very good advice. Please, please don't ask China to be like America as it is rising. <laughs> because if you're doing that, you're giving the wrong advice to China. So the question therefore is, what is the right advice to give to China? And how do we handle a situation which clearly doesn't fit into any of these perspectives? And I believe there is actually a three-part solution to this question of how to handle and create a sustainable, positive relationship with China, between China and America. There are two things that America can do and one thing that China can do. On the part of America, and this is an idea that comes not from me, it comes from Bill Clinton, and actually I've discussed it in one of my books, The Great Convergence, and I heard, I heard it being said recently at a dinner uh, in the home of Michelle from Gareth Evans. Gareth Evans, uh, former Australian foreign minister, was on a panel with uh, Bill Clinton, and Bill Clinton's advice to his fellow Americans, as far as I can tell, was clearly America has two choices today. Either you continue to strive to be the top dog forever, to be number one forever, or if you think you can't be number one forever, why not try to create a world in which you'll be comfortable in when you're no longer number one? And therefore, Bill Clinton's, I must say, sensible advice was, why not create a rules-based world you have more international law, partnerships, multilateralism. And the reason for doing that, the reason for creating a multilateral world is that America, by slipping on the handcuffs of multilateralism on itself, will then pass on the handcuffs to the next number one power, which is China. That's Bill Clinton's advice, and I agree completely with it. Why doesn't America, while it is still number one, create a world in which it will be comfortable when it is no longer number one? And the good news here, I have to give you some good news since I've given you so much bad news, is that I think China can accept a multilateral rules-based order. The reason being the Chinese don't have a global plan or global vision to shape the world, change the world. They're actually quite happy with the world that exists today. China today is the biggest beneficiary of the rules-based order that America gifted to the world at the end of World War II. So why should China want to change it? And I can tell you, I was in Davos uh, last year, in January 2017, hearing Xi Jinping speak about how China wanted to create a rules-based order. And I think he meant it quite sincerely because China is benefiting from it. And as you know, I mean, this is a subject of a long discussion, but America's attitude towards multilateralism has always been ambivalent. On the one hand, it's created lots of institutions, IMF, World Bank, WTO, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, it has weakened many of these multilateral institutions. So why not switch from a policy of weakening multilateralism to strengthening multilateralism? And if we can create a rules-based order, that rules-based order will lubricate the relationship between China and America and avoid 
a collision. And I, and I say this, by the way, as someone who, like George Ball, was also ambassador to the UN for 10 years. And I can tell you that multilateralism works. When you put people together in a room, you get them to negotiate, you get them to agree, they do reach agreements, they, they do reach conventions, and then the conventions hold, like the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is fundamentally holding. And it's still there, even though the United States has not ratified it yet. So that's one thing <coughs> that the US can do. The second thing that the US can do is to demonstrate the power of democracy, not through preaching, but through its internal behavior <coughs> by showing Excuse me. that if you have a democratic society, you outperform everybody else. You produce the world's most dynamic economy. You produce the best research and you produce the best political leaders. Because at the end of the day, the reason why, I, I must emphasize, uh, I, I admire the United States, I grew up as a child in, enthralled by the United States, because it's an amazing society, it's done things that no other human society had done before. But it was your internal performance that inspired everyone. When you send someone to the moon, wow, that's amazing, it inspires everyone. So, the best way to show the power of democracy is not by talking about it, is not by saying like George W. Bush saying that if you don't become a democracy, you have failed. Just do it. Show the world that a successful democracy can outperform everybody else. And by the way, if it leads to a competition between China and America in the economic sphere, right, between your industries and Chinese industries, that's good for the world. Economic competition is not a zero-sum game. Economic competition, at the end of the day, produces, as we know, better results for everyone. So more economic competition between US and China in a rules-based world is a good thing. And that's what the United States can do and show we can do better than you. It can be done. You can still do it. But of course, I would say, don't underestimate the competition from China. Because if you see how much they have achieved in the last 40 years, put on your seat belts, the next 30 years will be even more amazing. So don't underestimate Chinese economic competition. And the third thing, as I said, what China needs to do is that China needs to understand in a very deep way that its rise, its rapid rise, has created concerns all over the world, not just in America. Even in its own neighborhood, in Southeast Asia, where I come from, there is a lot of concern. And it's a natural concern. Imagine we are all in this room together right now as a tiny little mouse in that corner. And suddenly while you're sitting in the room, that mouse becomes an elephant. <laughs> in the same room, surely you'll be concerned, right? That's how all the neighbors of China feel. And it's perfectly natural. And the Chinese are sometimes puzzled by that. They said, we haven't done anything to you. We haven't sent an army to invade you. We haven't uh, taken things away from you. We haven't done what Teddy Roosevelt did in 1897. Why? Why are you so worried about us? Well, size. And China, of course, and this is not a secret, has made some mistakes. It has become rather assertive in its foreign policies. But at the same time, I add a qualification. It has become assertive, but not aggressive. 
And this is one thing that future historians, again, will compare and look back, let's say that in the 28 years since the Cold War ended, China has not bombed one country. Not one. How many countries has America bombed? Now, behavior matters. So, if we want to ensure that China continues to not bomb countries, we have to create, again, the logic for that not happening. But I think we can persuade the Chinese that because you've become so big, everything you do has a mega effect, so please be more careful in what you do. And my sense is that the Chinese are beginning to understand that they have to be more careful in how they handle the rest of the world because they can feel the blowback that's coming. So at the end of the day, to conclude, I would say clearly we face a big challenge in ensuring that there's no collision between China and America. But if we all make the right strategic adjustments, and this is a critical point, America had never, ever, maybe in the last 150 years, had to make strategic adjustments to another power. Never. Now, it's got to learn the art of making strategic adjustments. It can be done, and I hope it will be done. Thank you. Let me start us off with the first question, but then open it up. We have tremendous expertise in this room. But I guess one question I'd like to ask you is, I fully understand the sense that we need to give China more space, if you will, in multilateral institutions to express themselves, to have influence in those institutions. But how is it that you imagine that those institutions would somehow better align uh, China's own ambitions and economic practices uh, with those multilateral norms. Mm. I mean, I think, what, what evidence do you have? I mean, they've joined the WTO, they've made many reforms in doing so, but having taken these steps, what do you see as the effect efficacy, the effectiveness of those institutions in actually playing a role going forward in bringing China more deeply into uh, a rule-based system. In fact, we're seeing a lot of pressures mm. in the United States and globally against those institutions mm. going deeper yeah. into creating uh, binding frameworks that mm. bring us together. Well, let me, let me give you one concrete example of how multilateral institutions and processes uh, have changed Chinese behavior fundamentally. And this is, of course, uh, in the area that is of great global importance today, which is global warming. And look at the two conferences that were held, the Copenhagen conference that was a disaster, and the Paris conference that led to agreements. What was the difference between the two? Now, up to Copenhagen, China took the correct view, by the way, uh, uh, which is that global warming is happening today, not just because of the new flows of greenhouse gas emissions from China and India. It's also happening because of the stop of greenhouse gas emissions that the, has been put in the atmosphere since the Western Industrial Revolution. So the Chinese point of view and the Indian point of view, and China and India, as you know, agreed completely on this subject, was that hey, if you want us to pay an economic price to reduce the flows of greenhouse gas emissions, you, the West, must pay a price for the stock. And if you don't pay a price for the stock, I will not pay a price for the flows. And I expected the Chinese to stick to that agreement because there is a legitimate argument to make and they could have just hung on to it. But somehow or other, the Chinese, number one, did their own studies. Their own studies showed that China would suffer a great deal from global warming. Uh, number two, they observed the global uh, opinions forming on that is, in that area and said, okay, why don't we position ourselves in a more reasonable position? And then 
boom, they said, okay, we'll take on our obligations and we make a commitment to join the Paris Agreements. And these are hard commitments. Huh? These are mean, I mean, you know, in terms of the economic costs, they have to reduce the number of power stations, they have to change the energy usage and things like that. They, do, they did quite a lot. So this is a concrete example how, in a sense, global opinion changed China's behavior on a fundamental global challenge. And I, have, I, I can say as ambassador to the UN, I've actually observed that people walk into the room with very stiff national positions. But after they hear all the voices in the room, they, 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 they're, they're human beings. You know? They say, OK, that guy has a point. Well, he has a point. She has a point. Maybe I should listen to that kind of thing. So the process, I think, uh, is a very important one. And I think that Chinese clearly want to be seen. I mean, as you know, Bob Zelig famously called upon China to be a responsible stakeholder. And the Chinese want to be a, a responsible stakeholder because they are great beneficiaries of it. But they, are, they, they want some changes. Huh? To give you the, the obvious example, is, you know, that since the IMF and World Bank were founded in the 1940-something, <coughs> You have a rule that says to become the head of the IMF, you must be European. To become the head of the World Bank, you must be American. Now, that rule hasn't changed like almost 70 years now, right? Now, that rule's got to go. Surely, out of the population of 7.3 billion people in the world, you can find one or two maybe smart Asians or Africans to become the head of IMF and the World Bank, you know? I mean, it can be done. But these, these, there are some institutions where the West has a sense of proprietorship of them and refuses to share power in them. I think the best thing that uh, uh, the West could do is allow non-Western people to run these organizations, and then you get a different multilateral order. Mm, OK, very good. Well, uh, I think we're going to have, I know uh, Professor Nathan uh, is uh, going to give uh, ask a question. Now I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll, we'll really open What's it up. What's really scary is you'll be disappointed that we don't, Mike, we don't disagree with as much of what you said as you hope. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to ask, I, I disagree with two parts. I wanted Jerry to talk about one of those parts. I won't, which is whether China's better off. Jerry, I give that to you. But I want to ask about <clears throat> sources of American mistrust of China. I agree with you that we should, that, that we should get the size of the China threat correct. They're not invading us, et cetera. But it seems to me there really is an important strategic uh, area of friction with China, which has to do with Southeast Asia and the Western Pacific and the fact that the United States has been militarily dominant there mm. for all these years, and China doesn't like that and wants to change it. And I mm. think that's an important source of perhaps not world war, mm. but of, of real conflict. And you mm. haven't mentioned that. You act as if it's just the so-called values mm. question, but there really are some strategic issues. Yeah. And we don't really know the extent of China's strategic ambition, what the Belt and Road is going to be, what the port in Djibouti is going to be, how much they need in order to feel safe. We don't have a good sense of that. So I wanted mm. you to talk about the sort of hard material aspects of the yeah. security issue. Thank you. I, I, I'm actually very surprised that Andy doesn't disagree with me <laughs> that much. <laughs> Uh, no, but you're right. I mean, there are, there are many areas of contention. And, I, and in fact, you, could, you can also give a lecture on the military slice, the economic slice, and uh, other the cultural slice of the competition, and so on and so forth. But on the military slice, uh, Andy, my response to you is that the, 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 the Chinese have a very nuanced view uh, of the American military presence in the region. For example, I don't think that the Chinese want you to walk away from your defense alliance with Japan. Because an independent Japan will become a nuclear Japan, and they don't want that. So they actually value having the US uh, uh, alliance with Japan. And by the way, you know, both you and I were discussing uh, Kissinger's book on China and how Mao Zedong actually told Kissinger, you must spend more time in Japan. You must look after Japan. <laughs> I mean, that's amazing, you know. Uh, Mao Zedong saying, you know, don't, Japan is an important country. You must take care of it. So the, the, the Chinese have a very nuanced view uh, of these countries. But at the same time, I know the one thing that, that the Chinese are very, very angry about, and this is a fact, 
is the aggressive naval patrolling by US naval vessels 12 miles off China's shores. That they have really upset them. Because, you know, whenever, you know, any country will do this, by the way. Including any, China. huh? Including China. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so they, it, it, and, 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 and I actually uh, believe that what you do today, China will do tomorrow. So if you aggressively carry out naval patrolling 12 miles off China's shores, they've already begun, I think, off Hawaii, Pacific, or Guam, but they will reach California. The Chinese Navy will carry out aggressive naval patrolling of California, and I think that's not necessary. Neither side benefits from it, and of course the rationale for the American Navy for doing so is that we are protecting uh, uh, freedom uh, of navigation. And ironically, the country that needs freedom of navigation more than America does is the world's number one exporter, which is China. <laughs> China actually wants greater freedom of navigation than, than, you, than, needs, than the United States does. So the Chinese will be happy to work with you uh, in that area. But when it comes to the aggressive naval patrolling, or as you know, in the case of planes that fly close to Chinese borders, that's what really uh, upsets them. And, and they're trying very hard to reach an understanding within that area. Now, South China Sea is another issue, okay? Now, the, the, the South China Sea issue is it's a complicated issue. Uh, as you know, several countries are claiming uh, reefs and rocks and over there. There are, there are four ASEAN countries, Philippines, Brunei, Malaysia, Vietnam, and then Taiwan and China are claiming there. And it's true that the Chinese have been claiming a lot of land in the South China Sea. But the Chinese didn't start this game, by the way. Unfortunately, I mean, I say unfortunately because the Malaysians and Filipinos had no idea what would happen. They, they claimed two acres, three acres. The Chinese said, okay, you claim, I claim. But the Chinese claimed 2,000 acres. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a game that they unfortunately started and they're stuck with it now. now this is how the Chinese are being assertive. Now, if they want to be aggressive, the Chinese can remove the Malaysian, Filipino, Brunei, Malaysian soldiers, Vietnamese soldiers off those islands in 24 hours. They can do it if they really want to be aggressive. And by the way, that's what the United States would have done in 1897. But China in 2018 will not do that. And, 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 and that, to some extent, shows some degree of restraint now. How will the South China Sea issue be resolved? I can tell you it will be resolved eventually through various kinds of bilateral negotiations. And this, this has been documented and studied, Andy. In fact, it's in one of your readings. I saw that too. The Chinese have been very generous in their border settlements, except for the, only the three that are not resolved yet. Uh, but most of the time, when they resolve border issues, they've been quite generous. They say, okay, you take more, I take less. So that, that will be part of the negotiations uh, that, will, that will carry on. But again, a lot depends on whether or not you're dealing with an angry China that feels it's being pushed around, or a China that says, okay, you treat me with respect, I treat you with respect, we can work together. I think that's what it's going to happen. But I can take a bet with any of you that there'll be no war in the South China Sea in 2018. Come and see me after the... <laughs> 2018 is a short time frame. But let me invite Jerry Cohen to add his uh, voice and question. I, I know he'll disagree with me. <laughs> Courage in coming back here and telling us how we should set things right. And I think you would be surprised at the extent to which many of us uh, agree with your message, certainly the burden. I'm uh, not an economist. We have many distinguished economists here. I'd love to hear them address the issue whether the next 40 years will be as promising for China's economy and development as the past 40 have been, as you rightly point out. Uh, I, I would love to have you also talk about, you mentioned mildly, there's no freedom of speech in China. 
I think you have to recognize the reality of what's been taking place in recent years. There is increasing repression. If things were so good for the growing middle class that the economic development has spawned, why the need for increasing repression, arbitrary detention, lawlessness, party domination of the judicial institutions as well as, why is that necessary? But that isn't my real question. <laughs> my real question is, no one has yet mentioned Taiwan. Could you give us your analysis of the Taiwan situation the way you've just given us your analysis of the South China Sea situation? Because I think the Taiwan issue will prove to be more difficult to deal with, and we may not have forever to deal with it. Mm. Okay, my God. This is... Did I make the right decision coming here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Those are tough questions, but let me answer them as honestly as I can. The, actually, the Taiwan issue is very easy to answer. Uh, because the, you know, there's, there's, um, I, 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 I didn't have time to say this. Huh? The Chinese, uh, and this is actually, this, all, all those, if you read, I mean, if you only read Kissinger's book on China and everywhere else, they, they describe to you, when Chinese look at a problem, they always take a long view. They don't have the American expectation that you can solve problems within one presidential term in four years. Four years is just a drop. They often have a 10-year, 20-year, 50-year perspective. And I'm absolutely certain they have a 50-year perspective on Taiwan. And I think they're, getting, they're going to develop a level of interconnectivity between Taiwan and China that will be so phenomenal. It already is, already is there in terms of economic dependence of Taiwan on China, in terms of uh, people traveling from Taiwan to China, China to Taiwan, as you know, uh, uh, millions travel and so on and so forth. So by, that, by the time when Taiwan becomes so interconnected with uh, China, the idea of independence will disappear. And uh, they, of course, will be uncomfortable if uh, a, a non-KMT leader emerges, but they, they are now confident enough to know I guarantee you this, no country in the world today is going to recognize Taiwan. No country as an independent country. It will not happen. In fact, the few countries that still recognize the Republic of China are there because China wants to allow Taiwan to save face and they're still allowed to keep some countries. But those countries, if the Chinese wanted them to switch, they'll switch overnight. Okay, so the Taiwan issue is not a problem in that sense. It'll be managed. And there'll, be, there'll, there'll also, by the way, be no conflict on the Taiwan issue. Uh, and I think the Taiwanese themselves are also understanding the, the correlation of forces is working against them, and they have to adapt and adjust. I tell you, even Fred Chen, some of you may know him, you must know him, the former foreign minister of Taiwan, said to me in a Harvard lecture in 1991, now this is 27 uh, years ago, he said, Kishore, all the Chinese have to do is to announce a blockade of Taiwan. The insurance costs of every ship going to Taiwan would be so high, we'd be killed as an economy. So they, they want to, they can, they can turn off the Taiwanese economy whenever. So Taiwan is not the issue. I think they, they want to make sure it doesn't become independent, but it's not the one that they worry about. Your first question is a harder one. Why is there increasing repression? And the, the honest answer I can give you is that at the end of the day, the Chinese believe that for the 1.4 billion people to continue to do well, you need to have a very high degree of political order and stability. And Chinese history teaches you that when the center weakens, you know, the Chinese word for chaos, I think it's Luan or something like that, chaos returns. So they actually believe as a, as a principle of China's rule that strong central control is always necessary. Now, when you talk of, let's say, uh, higher levels of repression, the question is, which is the benchmark you're using? I mean, certainly if you use Mao's times, things obviously 
uh, uh, are much better. If you, if you look in terms of the, I don't have the data, I think you do on the number of political prisoners and so on and so forth. Uh, but I would say on balance, if you, if, you go, if you go to China on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't see that in front of you, you know? Uh, and, and, you know, I, I would say when I used to go to uh, China in the early 1980s, there was still uh, a sense of fear it was there, right? Uh, today, that sense of fear has diminished. And you're right, uh, the, it's, it's a complex story, but if you give the, the, any Chinese government the choice between stability and order or allowing dissent and chaos, they will choose stability and order. And that's what they will do. I would say you have a very optimistic view mm. of the situation in Taiwan, mm. and you have a very optimistic view of the internal situation in China. You keep saying, if the Chinese, the Chinese are one leader mm. and the people around him now, there are huge members of the elite mm. who are very unhappy. Xi Jinping's father, after 16 years in the Maoist wilderness, came back in the early 80s, and he preached to the party, we will never achieve our goals unless we allow differences of opinion. Bu Tong Yi Jin. Despite his preference for Confucianism, mm. which makes Xiao filial piety mm. so crucial, Xi Jinping has gone against the advice of his mm. father. He was a Chinese too. Mm. And there are many Chinese in the elite who are against the current repression, which is why you have the repression. So I think China is a more unstable place, and Xi Jinping knows it better than the rest of us in terms of the corruption, mm. the poverty, mm. the environmental problems. Uh, he knows, I think, China is a cat on a hot tin roof that has a terrific worldwide PR system right now. <laughs> so I think we have to be realistic in looking at what's going on in China. Yeah. Let, let me tell you where I agree and disagree with you, Jerry. I, I agree with you that Xi Jinping is acutely aware of the tensions within China. I agree with you that. Let me tell you where I disagree with you. I've heard statements like yours consistently over the last 30 years. People like you have been making these statements about China on a hot tin roof, about to collapse, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And I would say for 20 years I've been writing that it won't happen. <laughs> you can go back to my first book, Can Asians Sting? It's a very definitive essay down there saying, you got it wrong. Okay. So, uh, I, I, no, no, I, that, 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 that China will keep on growing. It will become stronger. It will remain stable. It will have a bigger economy. It will educate more of its people. It will send more of its young people overseas. More of its young people overseas will go back to the repressive country. It will continue to send not 120 million, but uh, two years from now, 200 million Chinese overseas. And 200 million Chinese will return overseas to the repressive society you speak about. So that's the data I give back to you. Continue this thread, Thank you very much for your speech. Firstly, and also uh, for your answer to the professor about Taiwan, I'd have to say, based on my experience in China, extensively in meetings with Chinese business leaders regularly, I concur with your farsightedness in this regard. There is one ethnicity at the end, and the political differences will evaporate as the cultural and economic ties grow, especially for the younger generation. And thank you for stating that so eloquently. But there's another elephant in the room, and I would love to hear your views on the problem that I think is worse potentially, namely the Korean problem. How, how are we going to deal with, with North Korea and how is there any hope then for the U.S. and China to become closer in attempting to resolve that thorny issue? Please give us your views. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I would say the North Korean issue is a very complicated issue. Okay. But let me suggest that I, again, I'm optimistic, number one, that there'll be no war on the Korean Peninsula. And I'll tell you why. Because none of the great powers want a war on the Korean Peninsula. I see the United <coughs> States and China have disagreed on many things. But if you look at the, rec uh, the diplomatic record of the last 20, 30 years, paradoxically, the, the North Korean issue has often brought American and Chinese negotiators back to the same table to keep on talking. 
And that's an issue on which they both agree on. And as you know, China has, uh, to my surprise, uh, I never thought, if you had asked me 20 years ago whether China would have voted in favor of UN Security Council sanctions on North Korea, I would have said, no way. China would veto them. I am astonished. China has voted for several Security Council sanctions on North Korea, and that's a big deal. And, and, and it's important to emphasize that if the United States feels frustrated with North Korea, China feels even more frustrated with North Korea, very, very deeply, and they're very angry. And if you want to know how angry, uh, something unusual is that since Xi Jinping became president, he's never met the North Korean leader. <laughs> that's a very powerful signal. Uh, that's being sent uh, over there. That's very unusual. And so the Chinese realize that a war on the Korean Peninsula will be disastrous, and they would, uh, they would be caught in a war that they don't want, as they were, as you know, in the first Korean War. But is there a solution? And I think there is a solution. Uh, uh, I've written about it, and building on an idea by a Harvard professor, uh, Roderick McFarquhar, who said, if the United States wants to give an incentive for China to encourage the reunification of the peninsula, the United States should declare that in the event that North and South Korea reunify, all American forces would leave the Korean peninsula. Korea would be no longer be an ally of the United States, and therefore an ally of the United States planted against China by a neutral, independent country. And then he said, then of course the Chinese would have an vested interest there and say, okay, maybe a reunified Korea that is not an a, a ally of the United States would be not a, something that they can live with. And, but let me add something else, something more mischievous, which I put in my book. It's in the, it's, I put it in print so I can tell you. <laughs> what I add down there is that if a, a neutral, independent Korea would be a far bigger problem for China than a Korea that is an ally of the United States. Because the Koreans and Chinese have had friction for 2,000 years. That friction is not going to end. So even if North Korea goes and there's a united Korea, that united Korea will assert its independence of China fiercely. And as fiercely as the Vietnamese are doing. And this, this, this is all history, you know. So in that sense, a bit more diplomatic flexibility on the part of the United States could make a difference to the issue. Then let me ask you one follow-up on that. Uh, you, you know, short of a reunified uh, Korean Peninsula, mm -hmm. what do you think is the, I mean, we have very bad behavior by North Korea. Mm. And the sanctions, uh, joint sanctions, was a really important uh, mm. development. But I think, you know, we're in a situation where we're hoping that China will do more mm. uh, and has more influence on the North uh, than any other country. Mm. And so what do you think we can reasonably expect mm. they will do in their own interest uh, mm. to reduce tensions uh, mm. and yeah. produce better behavior on the part of the North. Mm. Because, you know, yeah. it's looking quite escalatory, yeah. uh, but for the last few mm. weeks. Well, I'm, I'm, the, 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 the sad part is that, they, as they say, on the North Korean issue, there are no good options. Yeah. There are only bad options. <laughs> and for example, if you, you, you're right. It's, it's, it's absolutely wrong for North Korea to have a uh, uh, nuclear capability. We must stop it. How do you stop it? You start a war. You start a war tomorrow. <laughs> you know about, I, I don't know what the estimates are, half a million to one million citizens of Seoul will die within 24 hours, not because of a nuclear bomb, but because of artillery shelling. The North Koreans have a few thousand, several hundred, thousand artillery uh, uh, position to deliver thousands and thousands of shells in Seoul, as you know, which is within artillery range. So you, there's not an option. So you start a war, you've got to be prepared to accept one million dead in the first day. Now, none of us wants to accept. Certainly, we don't want to see one million people die in the first day. So there's no military option. So then what do you do? You go back to the diplomatic option. 
And so you've got to try and continue the process uh, of squeezing North Korea. But here, the one radical idea I have is that, you know, diplomacy was created about 2,000 years ago, not to enable you to talk to your friends. Because when you send an ambassador to a friendly capital, he comes back with his head on. In the old days, you send an ambassador to an enemy capital, the king would decapitate the ambassador if he said something he didn't like. It's, it's a fact, it's happened. So you created the concept of diplomatic immunity. The concept of diplomatic immunity is the core of what diplomacy is all about. It means that you can send ambassadors to enemy capitals. United States is the only country that's reversed 2,000 years of diplomatic uh, norms to say that when I send an ambassador to a country, it's an act of approval. But that's all wrong. Diplomacy means when I send you an amb ambassador with diplomatic immunity, I don't trust you. That's why I'm sending you with diplomatic immunity. But the United States believes if it establishes relations with North Korea, it's an act of approval. If it establishes relations with Iran, it's an act of approval. If it establishes relations with Cuba, it's an act of approval. It's the opposite. So why doesn't the United States go back to a 2,000-year norm and immediately establish an embassy in North Korea? <laughs> what have you got to lose? Uh, well, here's a former diplomat. Let me ask uh, 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 Danny Russell to offer a few comments or questions, if I may. I'm going to be in trouble, not you. <laughs> Well, thanks, Kishore. Um, you covered a lot of ground, and there are many, many areas where I could comment. Uh, much that I agree with, as others have said. Um, you asked for feedback and uh, constructive uh, criticism. And one point I would make is that I think that you're offering a bit of a red herring when you pose the question in terms of whether China should move to democracy tomorrow. Uh, I don't think that that is the issue or the question that's surfaced by the laydown that you created about uh, China's astonishing economic growth, et cetera. I think the real question is whether, uh, and uh, back up to say, mm. you're right in posing the, the riddle of whether the assumptions about, uh, from, about China and about the inner cor the correlation between uh, engagement uh, and behavior, uh, economic growth, and uh, the emergence of democratic institutions is validated or not uh, in the case of China. Of course, history didn't end with your lecture, and I think these are questions that uh, we'll have to watch to find the answer to. But the issue isn't whether China is quote unquote ready for democracy. There are a thousand and one excuses uh, why democracy is inconvenient to any authoritarian uh, government. The question is whether uh, China has uh, the legitimacy uh, from institutions, whether China has the processes uh, that will allow it to sustain social stability and economic development over time. So that's one issue. Mm -hmm. The second issue is I think you're awfully benign in uh, your interpretation of China's behavior. The huge mistake that's commonly made in Washington and elsewhere is to uh, conflate China's rise uh, with China's actions. And the actions that are generating so much mistrust uh, include not only the uh, reclamation of, of land in the South China Sea, uh, but the threats and the uh, interference with the uh, shipping and the activities of rival claimants and smaller powers. So the principle here is not that the freedom of navigation operations by the Seventh Fleet of the U.S. Navy is threatening to China. The issue is that unless and until little Brunei uh, has the ability to sail throughout the South China Sea in international waters without being 
uh, threatened by the Chinese, then the global principle of freedom of navigation, freedom of the seas, which you rightly point out China ought to prize, uh, is subject to the China exception. And, and that, I think, is a manifestation of the behavior that generates such anxiety in connection with China's rise. Mm. Thank you. I must say that's very helpful, uh, constructive feedback because I'm actually looking for points like this that I can re deal with uh, in, in the book. One, the, the three key words you use, one is about the democracy issue, which you said is a red herring. So I would say, is it possible to persuade the United States to stop saying in its public statements, like the one I quoted from the George W. Bush, that China should become a democracy? Why don't we let the Chinese decide whether they want to become a democracy? Why does the United States have to tell China you should become a democracy? I mean, so, I mean from, from, as I said, from the point of a few, future historian, why, why is this young nation giving advice to old civilizations? You know? So I, I, I would say that if you can do that, then you'll stop being a problem. But if you continue to use it regularly, it actually, what it does is that, you know, if I, this is something I don't want to, I'm just going to mention in passing, okay, but it's, there's a huge cultural dimension to this problem also. There is a fear of what is called the yellow peril deeply embedded in the subconsciousness of Western history. And that's, it's a big subject. But when you keep using the democracy thing, it be, it's, it's part of a weapon to try and keep that distrust up. And that's why I say, let the Chinese decide how they're going to become a democracy. Then I would say, then, then that, that problem will be such a big problem. The second big question you use is a very critical word is legitimacy. Now, that's why the question I want to ask very simply is, do you, how many countries in the world view the Chinese government as a legitimate government of the Chinese people? And how many countries in the world view the Chinese government as an illegitimate government? As an ambassador to UN, I can tell you the vast majority of governments in the world see the Chinese government as a legitimate government. And the sources of legitimacy in the West come from the process of election to power, the sources of legitimacy, and I can refer you to a TED talk by someone called Eric Lee. Look at the competence of the Chinese government. Look at what they have done for the Chinese people. And you can say, surely many other governments would wish that they could do as much for their people in terms of improving the human condition of the population. And that, I would say, is the fundamental source of their legitimacy. Now, thirdly and finally, on South China Sea, uh, the, as you know, the um, uh, United States has become a key actor on the, on the South China Sea issue. But what the Chinese say is that the, Chinese, the United States is always advocating that China should abide by the norms of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea in South China Sea. They say, why does the United States ratify the convention then? Because I think once you do that, if you, if you don't do that, you have no moral legitimacy <laughs> to advise others. If you don't respect a convention, how can you ask others to respect the convention? But I can tell you on the South China Sea, just to also add to that, in my conversations with the Chinese officials, many of them actually, to be fair, retired officials, they do concede in private that they have made mistakes uh, on the South China Sea. And the more thoughtful ones agree with the argument I put to them. I say, you know, your China is a global power today. China needs freedom of navigation globally. If you claim the South China Sea within the nine dashed line to be your territorial waters, you may get 3% of the world's ocean, you lose 97% of the world's oceans. It's not in your interest to create a set of rules in the South China Sea that violates your global interests. And I think they're beginning to understand that. And that's why, as you know, vis-a-vis -vis the 
uh, ASEAN countries, the temperature went up, as you know, 2012, 2014. You know it's gone down significantly. And hopefully the progress will be made on that code of conduct. And it's a result, I think, in the part of the Chinese understanding also that they've been too as assertive on the South China Sea and it, it, it has cost them something. I think we are almost out of time. We have one. Uh, could I collect two last quick questions and let you have sure. a final word? Uh, Professor French and then Desai. Um, thank you. Nice to see you again. My I'm going to try to be quick. This is uh, pressure. Um, I want to raise the possibility with you that there's been, uh, first of all, many things to admire and to delight uh, among your comments, but I want to raise the possibility that uh, you have possibly, I don't think that's from here, uh, misappraised uh, some certainty. Maybe uh, just speak without the mic. Um, let me just hold it in a different way, maybe. Um, one of them looking backwards, the other one looking forwards. Um, so you have placed great emphasis on the United States lecturing China about democracy. I would um, warrant that the trend over time actually has been in the opposite direction, that American diplomacy places, public diplomacy places much less emphasis mm -hmm. on democracy in general over time, and especially in discussion with or around China. Uh, and you can uh, combine with the explicit term democracy ass assorted related terms such as human rights, um, et cetera, et cetera. That the United States, the trend, if you were able to plot this via news articles or State Department accounts, um, is actually in giving, to be crude about it, more face to China on this issue. Um, the, the, the bigger question I'm going to ask you looking backward, though, is whether you have not failed to give sufficient credit to the United States for accommodating China in terms of its economic rise. In other words, I, I don't say this as a protectionist at all. However, um, the United States has made possible China's rise by absorbing uh, its surpluses, uh, by uh, helping to usher it into the World Trade Organization. And as these things have happened, at debatably some considerable cost to the United States, what we've seen on the Chinese side is, in fact, a, a language that fails to acknowledge these things with its own public. Um, and the fact, this fact, I want to ask you, uh, I want to ask you whether or not this fact doesn't create the possibility of a grounds for mistrust in the United States about the socialization of Chinese public opinion and attitudes toward globalization, toward multilateralism, and toward the United States in specific. The, the second question, I'll be quicker with this no, going no, forward. I'm sorry, we have, we have another question here as well. Okay, sorry. all right. I'll Those are great questions and a lot for him to speak to. Oh, I have a brief question. The last 40 years and the next 40 years, uh, the economic prospects for the Chinese economy in the next 40 years, uh, in the 1990s, 1980s, 1990s, the economy grew, if the Chinese numbers are to be believed, 10% GDP growth rate, current GDP growth rate at sort of 7% mm -hmm. annual. Okay, um, but at the same time, the one-child policy has created enormous labor shortages. Uh, wages have gone up. And that is creating problems for uh, policymakers. That's affecting the growth rate of the economy. And now, telling people to have two children instead of one ch child, uh, as before. I mean, uh, or would they allow uh, migrants to come to China from, I don't know, uh, from uh, uh, Vietnam or maybe from Bangladesh. I mean, what do you think uh, the, mm. um, the economic prospects mm. uh, of this economy with a very high wage rate and labor shortage? Mm. Well, uh, I, I know your time is pressing. <laughs> Let me answer your question first, Padma, before I come to you. Uh, uh, on, on the Chinese management of their economy, uh, you're right. I mean, the one-child policy and they have demographic problems coming up and so on and so forth. But I would say the, the, the one thing the Chinese are good at is looking at a problem 20 years down the road, 30 years down the road, and working backwards and saying, okay, 
what are the implications for the policy today? And as you know, they have switched from the uh, one child policy to now encouraging two children, all kinds of qualifications, but more or less, more, most people can get two children. But the, it, the surprising thing about the Chinese economy is that it is no longer, is moving from its reliance on cheap labor. And China today, I think, has the largest army of robots of any economy anywhere in the world. They have, they have obviously anticipated that there's going to be labor shortages. So China will move ahead of the curve in terms of switching away from cheap labor. It makes up for the labor shortage. The yeah, yeah, the robots. So they have, they have, they have massively invested uh, uh, in robots and so on and so forth. So they are ahead of the curve in terms of dealing with that issue. And, uh, in, and by the way, China doesn't have to grow at 10%, doesn't have to grow at 7%. All it needs to do is grow at 5%. <laughs> it will double its economy by the law of 72 in 14 years. So can you